parent. In love, you have made us your own and invite us to join in your divine dance. We will never rest until we rest in you, blessed Trinity, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let's continue our worship today. Let's all stand as we sing. Who am I and that the Lord of all the earth will care to know my name, will care to feel my hurt? Who am I and that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever wandering heart? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. And I am the flower quickly fading, you today and gone tomorrow. Waiting tossed in the ocean, the day for in the
share some of the images and the God sightings of this week in our Vacation Bible School. Again, with great love, you know, we had this new phrase that sort of creeped up over the week. It was called VBS brain, and VBS brain means don't give me too many details because I've, my brain is full and my heart is overjoyed, and I'm really glad to be here, but I'm also counting down the days. And so when you get people that just sort of pour their hearts and their life into something so beautiful as this, well, the images start to speak for themselves. So turn on your BBS brains and just enjoy. <laughs> i 
So that looked like a lot of fun, and it was. <laughs> it was. Nothing greater than seeing the images of these children excited, welcomed, received, celebrated in the love of God of what that's happening. Thank you, congregation, for your support of these endeavors, not just this week, but every week in which we continue to put our best foot forward for the life of our community and, and for the outreach and the love of God in this place. So as we continue to give thanks for as many blessings, as we continue to make life possible for others beyond ourselves, so we give of our tithes and our offerings as the Lord has, has asked of us. And so we invite the ushers to come forward as we pray. Bless, O oh Lord, the continued images of life and new creation that are among us, for the movement of your spirit that continues to fill this place with your energy and your dynamic life. Inspire us, God, with that hope for the future and for the gift that is ours today. May we use these gifts of ours for the coming of the continuance of your kingdom in Christ our Lord. Amen. and sing, oh, praise Him, alleluia, thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with soft gleam.
Lord, we give you thanks that you are worthy of our praise and our thanksgiving. And now as we come to your word, we ask that you would open our ears and our eyes and our hearts to that which you might say to us today. In your precious name, amen. Does anybody recall who wrote that song that we just sang? St. Francis of Assisi. Some of you are familiar with St. Francis. It's a beautiful hymn. Two scripture lessons that we want to lift up today on this Trinity Sunday. And here's the good news. We're not going to solve the mystery of the Trinity in the remainder of our time today. So relax there. We're not going to try to solve the mysteries of those nuances. But it is enough for us to come and to sing our alleluias, to offer our words of praise and thanksgiving, and just to imagine the goodness of God in our lives. It's a good thing to do when you're filled with VBS brain. And our children have shown us the way this week. So I invite you to hear these words, one from Psalm 8 and the other from the 8th chapter of Proverbs. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. A reading from Psalm 8. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, and out of the mouths of babes and infants you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, I ask, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? Who are mortals that you care for them? And yet, you have made them a little lower than God, and you've crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands, You've put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And now a reading from Proverbs chapter 8. Let us hear. The word of the Lord. Does not wisdom call? And does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights, beside the way, at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portals, she cries out, To you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all who live. And then in verse 22, the Lord created me at the beginning of his work. The first of his acts of long ago, ages ago, I was set up. And at the first, before the beginning of the earth, where there were no depths, I was brought forth. And where there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. And when he had not yet made the earth and fields or the world's first bits of soil... When he established the heavens, I was there when he drew a circle on the face of the deep and he made firm the skies above. When he established the fountains of the deep and when he assigned to the sea its limits so that the waters might not transgress his command. I love that. When he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him, says wisdom, like a master worker. I was daily his delight. Rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the human race. And now, my children, wisdom says to us, listen to me. Happy are those who keep my ways, who hear my instruction and be wise and do not neglect it. Happy is the one who listens to me watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors, for whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But those who miss me injure themselves. All who hate me love death itself. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Don't miss me, she says. 
wisdom personified in this way where she just comes and stands out on the streets and calls us by name and says, I'm here. No, really, I'm here. Come and listen for me. Almost as if the Holy Spirit itself blowing amidst us. It's hard to compartmentalize. Okay, which part of God am I dealing with today? Is it Father? Is it Son? Is it Holy Spirit? This is wisdom. This is the very truth of God that dares not fit into our neat compartments, but continues to permeate our daily lives and our existence in ways that are life-giving. So on this Trinity Sunday, it is enough, perhaps, in terms of doctrine, to just simply stand up and affirm what is at the heart of our articles of religion within the United Methodist Church, and it says this about the Holy Trinity. It says, There is but one living and true God, everlasting, without body or parts, of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness, the maker and preserver of all things, both visible and invisible, and in unity of this Godhead, there are three persons. Three persons of one substance, power and eternity, the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Now, that's a lot. I wouldn't even begin to unpack all of that. What would be the fun of trying to compartmentalize all of that goodness and glory of God's nature? And so it is enough for us today to sit with the Psalms and to sit with the Proverbs and to imagine those places where God's life and work might seek to intervene and intersect into our daily decisions as well. The book of Proverbs is great for that. It's this collection of brief wisdom sayings of the teachers of Israel and if you've ever studied it or looked at it in depth, you know that it's very similar in some ways to what you find in Job and Ecclesiastes and several of the Psalms. Proverbs is what we call the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, wisdom literature so-called, because it focuses on wisdom, but not this sort of high, esoteric, unattainable, ungraspable, but that which is involved in the practical decision-making that is a part of our everyday living. It also refers to that body of writings that is derived I didn't largely get that. from the Could you try again? of keen observation. Now, I want to say that because I love that piece of the pie. You're, Sorry, I'm still not sure about that. A couple of times, you've got some experiences, you've learned a few things. There were things you thought maybe at this stage of life, and then you had some experience and said, nope, it's actually different than that now. And the more we learn, the more we grow. And if we ever stop learning and growing from our own mistakes and from our own interactions with people, well, we get stuck, don't we? That's always been one of my fears in life is that I would get older without growing wiser. <laughs> because when I was little, I used to think that the two automatically went together, right? You know, you think of wisdom, you think of somebody with a nice flowing gray hair and somebody that strokes their beard a lot and, you know, sort of a Santa Claus figure. But then as I got a little older and I got to know some other adults, I realized there are those among us who may grow older without growing wiser. And that would be a real tragedy. So how do we make sure that doesn't happen? Frederick Beatner refers to it as listening to your life, making the observations of our existence and learning from our own stories. And when we hold that practice up with the reading of Proverbs, what we recognize pretty quickly is that we don't read Proverbs the same way that we might read other stories in the Bible. It's not like we just, you know, plug and play and say, okay, here's what I'm supposed to do. Sometimes reading Proverbs feels a lot like a series of fortune cookies. You know, you break it open and there it is and you laugh at it and there it is for the day. With these brief nuggets of suggestions, pithy sayings, the intent of all that, of course, is to slow us down enough to stop and evaluate those specific situations in our lives in light of the character and the purposes of God and to think and to act and to grow in accordance with that divine wisdom. We see this, I think, in the influence and the style of Jesus' teaching. We see it in his parables. We see it especially in those I am statements that he makes in the Gospel of John. It's short, it's sweet, it's full of symbolic imagery, it's to the point. And for all of us with short attention spans this morning, like myself, Proverbs can be a great place to start reading your Bibles. Maybe when you just have a minute and you're like, I don't know, let me just turn a page. Proverbs is the place where you can get away with that and chances are something will grab you. You may not like what it has to say, <laughs> but you can do it and it will grab you. In his own reading of Proverbs, our ancestor John Wesley found much in common with his understanding of divine grace 
and the process by which one comes to accept God's grace and to grow in holiness. It's about growing us up and maturing in the faith. And so in his reading, and as we pick it up today, it is the teaching of this church, as we understand this text, that wisdom is first and foremost a gift from God. Secondly, that wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord, an awe and a respect for God. And last but not least, living by God's wisdom means that we engage in a certain kind of life, a life that is keeping in with God's will. When I read Proverbs, what strikes me about it and what I think we can come to enjoy so much about it is just how practical this religion really is. And if I push this off the edge, somebody catch me. Hear these words from Proverbs. When pride comes, it says, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Proverbs 11. Those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no excuse and no sense. Proverbs 12. Those who guard their lips preserve their lives. Ooh, that's a good one, right? Those who guard their lips preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly will come to ruin. Proverbs 13. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 15. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be lowly in spirit along with the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. Proverbs 16. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Proverbs 18. Let someone else praise you, he says, and not your own mouth, and not your own lips. Proverbs 27. You'll notice just in that brief list, there's an awful bit of reflection there on our own speech, isn't there? The things that we say, the attitudes that are reflected, what we say, what we don't say, as an indication of our relationship with God, our neighbors, and ourselves. And there is much in common here with our own understanding of God's grace, how it works, what it does in our lives, when we are open to it. Friends, where do you go for wisdom this morning? That seems to be a really big question these days. We all have our models. We all have our trusted sources, whether it's a favorite magazine or newspaper or, or other outlet. We have different ideas, different places, different institutions that we've come to trust. Where do you go for wisdom? Most likely, it's not a particular place, but perhaps a person or a word. Sometimes it is both, as in the Word made flesh to dwell among us. It doesn't have to be complicated, and yet it's always mysterious. And friends, when you read the Old Testament, you'll also notice that wisdom, and I'm talking wisdom with a capital W here, wisdom, when personified in the Old Testament literature, is almost always described as a woman. Now, that will be a surprise to about half the people in the room will not be a surprise to the other half of the room. But it is an observation that should not be lost on any of us. One of the most familiar stories that is a favorite in my family happened uh, at my grandparents' house years ago near Gainesville, Florida. When I was a kid, my grandparents had this big, green, kind of ugly, almost burlap feeling, wing-back chair with an ottoman that dominated the small confines of my grandparents' living room there in their double-wide trailer. For most of my childhood, it was simply known as Granddaddy's Chair, right? And that carried with it its own sort of gravitas. This is Granddaddy's Chair. Stay out of Granddaddy's Chair unless Granddaddy's already in it, or you have special written expressed permission. This is Granddaddy's Chair. It's a special place. And over the years, that footstool carried with it a certain mystique for me because it was a great place to play. And when you got bored at Granddaddy's house, it was a place to bounce. It was something to jump over. It was something to launch off of. But it became my playground. And it also inevitably had this mix of smell between Old Spice and chewing tobacco, 
which is a really toxic combination when you put them together just right, but it was there. And as much as I enjoyed that magical space, since my grandfather rarely ever left that chair, in, at least in my memory, he never wore a shirt, by the way, either. So that tells you just how special this chair was. Gives you, now, see, now the imagery has really come alive, hasn't it? Yeah. It was South Florida. There you go. My granddaddy Cal was not what the world would call a great man. But he was, as they say, a considerable hoot. And so the, the footstool of that chair became this entryway for me in this whole new dimension of love and wonder and hilarity. And it was just kind of a magical place. But it, has its, it, had, a, it had a certain identity until something changed. In 1987, my grandfather died of lung cancer. And it was then that I had what was for me one of the very first experiences of loss and grief as a child. And I had so many questions. And as one who had not grown up in the church or raised with a, a sense of faith or understanding of heaven or anything else of that matter, I had even more questions. It was one of the first times that I can ever remember talking to God a couple of years later, we were back there visiting my grandmother's and the rest of my family. We were there at the house there in Gainesville. And as was often the case in that new transition, it was fun, but it just wasn't the same, right? And I had this keen understanding that I was the only male that ever showed up at any of these gatherings now. I was surrounded by female cousins and sisters and aunts and mom and grandmother, and I was always the only male in the group. I was also the loudest in the group, which not a surprise. But I, it was as if I felt somehow responsible for carrying the mantle of entertainment to the rest of the family at a young age. Well, one day we were cutting up, we were horsing around, we were doing what we do or what I thought we were supposed to do. We were sharing comments back and forth, kind of digging on each other. And after a while, it sort of elevates for a while. And you know how it is. It's all good fun for a while, and it's really funny until somebody crosses the line. And at some point, I'm sure that I crossed the line. And I was in, while the comments were increasingly absurd, they were also increasingly foolish. And it was at that moment that my grandmother, Carolyn, spoke up. Now, my grandmother was about five foot one on a good day, had these nice little glasses that I always wondered what she was thinking behind them. And I do not remember what she said that day, but I remember the effect that it had on all of us in that moment. It shut us up. We were silenced. We were quiet. Suddenly we were listening in ways that we hadn't been before. We were compelled by the truth of what it was that she had just spoken over us. I can remember that I was sitting on the floor, the shag carpet there in that house at that time, and by sitting on the floor, I had no choice but to look up to her. And after a few moments of what I would now come to know as a sacred silence, I looked up at the rest of my family and I said simply, Wisdom speaks from the big green chair. That was it. My grandmother remained calm. My mother got proud just as she had always been. And there she was, sitting quietly in what I had, at that moment, always known to be granddaddy's chair. But at that moment, it was different. When Paul Kalb sat in that chair, it was a place of refuge. It was a place of leisure. It was where he could watch TV all day long and Bugs Bunny cartoons with me and have a sandwich brought to him and keep his spit cup close by, which I found really nasty. But when my grandmother Carolyn sat in it, that old chair was transformed. It had a renewed sense of dignity. It was where she could sit and look out the window and observe the beauty of nature and the birds, and the trees, and the creeping elements of God's creation. And it became for her the place for her to watch over the behavior and the decisions of her family with love. For years, that chair was transformed. When Carolyn sat on it, that big green chair lost some of its familiar stench of my family. 
it became rather a seat of mercy. It became a place of sovereignty. It was a throne of grace. The difference, of course, was not death. The difference was wisdom. Friends, wisdom can be elusive. Wisdom is sometimes hard to define, it's difficult to explain, even harder to manufacture on demand. But I think we can agree that when you see it, you know it. Wisdom may even seem uncommon or rare or hard to come by, and yet the word for today from the book of Proverbs reminds us that she is always there. Does not wisdom call? she asks from the street, and does understanding not raise her voice? On the heights beside the way at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town at the entrance of the portal, she cries out, To you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all who live. Woman wisdom. She makes her way to the heights, presumably to the highest tower in town. She utters her call as an invitation to all those who would enter into the city. And in our world of human commerce and big business and social organization and advertising and false promises in the life of the public square, wisdom takes her place and seeks out those who would learn from her. The Lord, she says, the Lord created me at the beginning of his work the first of his acts long ago. And as the preacher in Proverbs 8, wisdom stresses the creative power of God. And at the end of that chapter, we have this beautiful poem that dwells at length and with considerable joy on the wonders of the created world. Remarkably, wisdom is noted as the first of God's creation and human beings are noticed as the last of God's creation, which means we've been trying to catch up to what God was doing and saying and being in wisdom ever since, and this is the course and journey of our lives. God, what have you been trying to tell me from the very beginning? We don't find this wisdom ourselves. We don't create it ourselves. It has to be revealed to us. Friends, as you saw in those images, that was the joy for me in watching our vacation Bible school this week. Every day, every day, these kids would be introduced to some truth of who God is, and the program used all these different elements and creatures and critters of God's creation as tools for the teaching. On Friday, I stood right here and I sang and I danced with all the other students and all the other volunteers and the kids. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. I never was very good at the hand motions, but I was told that was okay. Later that afternoon, I got home, pen in hand, and I said, okay, boys, what were those lessons again? Now, these guys are 16 and 12 at this point. They were co-leaders. They were errand boys they were assistants but without a hesitation they looked at me and they said number one god loves you no matter what i went oh that's pretty good god is with you everywhere i said and day three god is in charge and day four god is stronger than everything and day five god is surprising and they looked at me and i said did you get all that dad and i thought i'm working on it son you know, those five things, <laughs> that's a pretty good week, right? That might be enough just for us to celebrate and to work on this morning. Rather than trying to explain the Trinity and all of its nuance and majesty, it may be enough just to declare our praise and call it good. But at Vacation Bible School, these kids were trained that after one of these themes was mentioned, that the appropriate response was what? I can't hear you. What was it? Now, I was here during the week, and y'all shouted this thing from the rafters. I'd say, God is in charge, and y'all would go, there it comes, up from the ashes, right? Every single time there was some declaration made, 
awesome God, there'd be this shout. And when you tell children, I want you to shout it and rip it and let it go for all it's worth, they tend to get pretty excited and they get pretty good about it. But what was so fun about it was somewhere around day two or day three and certainly well into day five, anytime Jenna or one of the other teachers or leaders would say anything that remotely sounded like the Father, Son, or Holy Spirit, there'd be a group of kids in the back right around there going, awesome God! And, and Jenna would stand here and go, no, hold on, wait for the prompt. That wasn't it. That's, we got to wait for the screen. And I just got so tickled because it was like, hey, you know, I'm here. It's Tuesday. Awesome God! I mean, they were fired up, right? They were ready to let it rip. And I thought to myself, that's the way I want to be. I don't want to be waiting for somebody to have to prompt me and say, okay, praise God here. I want to be so exuberant and so wound up and abounding in steadfast love and thanksgiving for the grandeur of God's creation that there's something that just explodes within me to shout, awesome God. I think there's wisdom in that response. Yeah, now you're getting it. That's right. Is that not what the scripture said that through the babes and through the infants? that God's praise would be declared. That's what happened here this week. And it's the exact thing that gets fired up and celebrated in the life of the text itself. Proverbs 8 says, I love those who love me. That's what wisdom says. I love those who love me. And those who seek me early and often find me. And I go, ooh, that's good. Because this week, friends, this church spent five straight days teaching young children about the monumental love of God. These children looked up to their youth leaders. They looked up to their adult leaders. But most importantly, they learned how to look up to God. And as much as we wanted to put God's love within reach for them, we also encouraged them to set their sights high. Because God's rule is this. Let your earliest aim be at the very highest. That is, if you can start from the beginning aiming here, you will not settle for anything that's down here. Let your earliest aim be the highest, the very wisdom of God. Those creatures, the armadillo, the funny-looking bird, the jackrabbit, the salamander, all those different things, they are cute and they are warm and they are fuzzy and they are amazing. But all of those creatures live and breathe in service to the Creator God. They invite us as children of God to come along with them in this work of praise. They know that sunlight will always be more stimulating than a light bulb or candlelight. They know that oceans are always more impressive than our backyard pools. They know that the view of outer space in your backyard is more accessible and more majestic even than Disney's line to Space Mountain. And if you want to awaken a child's admiration, if you want to increase their sense of awe for truth with a capital T, then you point them to the top of the ladder and not just to the rungs that they can already reach. Point them to God above all things. Friends, in the life of Fair Hope United Methodist Church, our desire, our heartfelt desire is to teach them to fix their eyes on that which is absolute beauty. We direct them to hold on to the threshold, to the flawless, to the peerless, to the unmatched majesty of God. When I look at your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, O oh God, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? What are mortals that you care for them? Or otherwise, as a child might ask, who am I, God, that you'd pay attention to me? And I think that's a good question. Linda King told me the story of a young man who was sitting right here, scooting around the floor back and forth, and somewhere on day four, his very small in stature but big in brain and heart self turned to her and said, Miss Linda, who made God? Ooh. Who made God? She said, I hope he keeps asking. She explained to him, gave him a very fine Trinitarian doctrinal answer that was appropriate and well justified. But at the end of the day, it's a child who's in awe and wonder of something that is bigger than him and wants to know what's behind it and what's a part of it 
And where do I fit in in the midst of that? Who am I that you would care for me? It's a great question. So we lead them. We lead them, not just to the outer court of the temple where the popsicles are shared, not just to the gaga ball pit and the rest of the playground that tests their spirit and their strength and their tenacity and their patience, but we lead them also to the Holy of Holies, into the heart of worship where the highest sits supreme. We point them to the earliest and the highest so that they can descend from God to us. We point them to the divine wisdom because trying to ascend to God by ourselves just doesn't work. This week, we said to the very souls of our children, aim first at the skies, to the monumental love of God. Do not settle for anything here on the ground. Do not settle for the wisdom of Plato or Socrates or Instagram or even TikTok. Yes, you may find some flashes of light here and there, but do not settle for the limits of that understanding. And rest assured that no matter where you go or what appeals to you or what your attraction, whether you're on the heights, beside the way, or at the crossroads of life engaging some real decision-making, be assured that no matter what your situation, no matter the chaos or the struggle or the suffering or the confusion, whatever the decisions, children, that you have weighing before you, Know this, wisdom is there. She's already there. Why? Because wisdom has done her part. She is calling all those who live. She has been there from the very beginning of creation, all along just waiting to be discovered. She is out there waiting to be found. She is truth. She is love. She is integrity. She is accountability. And she is there, waiting to be followed. This week, we did not say, well, kids, glad you're here. Let's just go ahead and take it easy. Let's start kind of slow and low. Let's see how it goes. We'll wait for you to get acclimated to the height as we go. Let's ease our way and see how it goes and whether you want to come back the next day. No, we didn't do that. We said, day one, hey, kid, listen up. God loves you no matter what. And they went, and we were off to the races. And then we got God, day two, God is with you everywhere. And they said, everywhere? Everywhere. You mean he saw that too? Yes, he saw that too. Everywhere. And then we said, hear the good news. Day three, God is in charge. And then we kept going. And the rest of the week just got better from there. And through it all, in the hallways and in the praise moments and the science experiments and the gaga ball and everything else and the singing and the praising and the relationships that were built, wisdom, woman wisdom, stood there in the middle of it all this week and asked the question, is this an awesome God or what? To which the children of God replied, Awesome God. Now try that with me, if you will. Is this an awesome God or not? Is this an awesome God or what? See, the children, they can do it, can't they? Do not ever lose that shout. Don't let the world take that voice from you. Lead us in God's name, dear ones. Is this an awesome God or not? I should say so. I believe we should all say so. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Precious and loving God, your awesomeness is so beyond our ability to declare it. You call us from the streets, reminding us of your presence. You gift us with creation, filling us with wonder. You lift our eyes above above the darkness of our own pit and our own frustration and continue to declare with joy a sense of purpose that is well beyond our immediate reach. You've lifted our eyes unto the hills of where is our help? It is in the awesome God. So how majestic. 
How marvelous, how wonderful is your love, O oh Lord, for us this day. We rest simply in the goodness that you are, that you have been, that you will be. We rest in the goodness of your son, Jesus Christ, who came to became the word, made flesh to dwell among us and continue to teach and to guide us. And we thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit that has promised to teach us everything, even to the end of the age. So let us start early and let us stay true and let us aim high and let us love you. This is our prayer this day. As we come together as your people, your church, God, we pray for your church, for this denomination of ours, for its leaders, for our bishop, for all of our delegates and friends and brothers and sisters. God, give us your wisdom that is beyond our own today. Let us not walk in and assume that we know what needs to happen, but let us be attentive to your will and that in our stories, your story might resonate with us. Shape us, mold us. Lord, bless our families. There are people here who are, who are wondering who are struggling, who are hurting, who are scared. Whatever the case, whatever the cause, God, we pray your wisdom will go before them. And they might find the encouragement and the, and the consolation to know that you are there. You're everywhere. You're so strong. And you are in charge. So surprise us, oh God, yet again, with your love this day. In the name of our Lord who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us our stay, our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now, you guys know that I don't preach in this service a whole lot, but when I do, I get spoiled by this band. And so as I'm reading scriptures and I'm thinking about my own story and songs and music that speak to me, there are times where I kind of get out on a limb a little bit and go, you know, I don't know if this one's going to show up in the hymnal, but it's so cool. And I believe that these folks can pull it off by God's grace. And if we can have good humor and good celebration, maybe we can really get into it good news is we always do these songs last so if you're totally appalled by the heresy you can run for the door but don't be appalled by the heresy because the truth is no matter where we find ourselves no matter what decisions we are making wherever the intersection of our life and faith may be God is there and now in light of the reading of Proverbs 8 this old song that I know and love is one of my top five favorites I will never hear it the same way again and I think that's pretty cool that the wisdom of God has a way of redefining what we think we knew and reminding us of his presence. So I'm going to invite you to stand. And I invite you to boogie. But I invite you to love and to be loved by a God who calls us and shapes us. And may you go forth this day in his presence and his power. If you want to join this church, I hope you'll come grab me and let me know afterwards. I'd love to have that conversation with you. But if you're just visiting with us today, I hope you know that there's a home for you here. And if you've been here a long, long time, I hope you'll remain committed to what God is about to do next in our life together. Because we love you. We love you. We love you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Go in peace and have a great week.